The Spanish artist Salvador Dali, as a child, was given a subscription to a magazine that each week featured a puzzle in which some figure was concealed. It was often a dog or a rabbit. Already strange as a youngster, Dali recalled that he nearly always saw not one hidden rabbit, but two, or maybe three or four, none of which was the one that the artist was trying to hide. Years later, Dali's adult paintings often featured hidden figures, but puzzle pictures of this kind have a long history, as shown in this rendition of The Isle of Dogs or as portrayed in this Hindu image of the god Krishna on his travels. During the first half of the 20th century, puzzle pictures were also known as embedded figures or, in the wake of World War I, as camouflaged figures. Here is one example that appeared in The Strand magazine in 1907. The caption reads, this gentleman calls for his footman. Where is he? Hidden figures are not always easily found. They are a challenge to construct and a challenge to decipher. They require that the artist as well as the viewer engage in shifts of emphasis. In solving the puzzle, parts of the drawing that were initially ignored become sharply focused on. Once the figure has been found, it is thereafter easily seen. In this case, the footman is slightly above and right of the dog. The rightward handle on the face is the footman's eye, and one of the footman's arms is one of the legs of his master. In this second example, also from the Strand magazine, there is a gathering of anarchists but a spy is there to catch them. The caption asks, where is the detective? But this one is too easy because everyone is looking at him and he is quickly spotted in the upper right half of the puzzle. Yet another example dates from 1929, 10 years after World War I, but its subject is a variety of camouflage that was popular during that war. It is a drawing of a dazzle-painted ship, an approach to camouflage that works not by concealment, but instead by fragmentation for the purpose of causing confusion. As is evident, the continuity of the ship has been interrupted by abstract geometric shapes. The caption for this puzzle reads, an American camouflage transport ship leaving New York on its way across the Atlantic with our American soldiers. Find a sailor. Unfortunately, it seems that the sailor has fallen overboard. He is nearly as large as a vessel itself. He is embedded in the water, floating on his back, his head in line with the front of the ship. A picture puzzle featuring a ship is especially appropriate because it was most likely World War I ship camouflage that prompted people to refer to picture puzzles as camouflage figures. But the credit is also partly due to a branch of psychology that began in Europe in advance of World War I. Called Gestalt Psychology, it was founded by three German psychologists, Max Wertheimer, Kurt Kofka, and Wolfgang Kurler. After World War I, the Gestaltists established a graduate program at the University of Berlin, where one of their students was Kurt Gottschalt. In his experiments, Gottschalt showed his subjects complex arrangements of lines in which smaller, simpler shapes are hidden. It may have been his research that familiarized the public with the term embedded figure. But other Gestaltists also talked about the practice of breaking up figures in camouflage. Among them, Wolfgang Kurler, when he spoke about making objects disappear by painting upon these things irregular designs, 
the parts of which are likely to form units with parts of their environment. Not surprisingly, embedded figures have also been used in advertising. During World War I, for example, at the height of the public's interest in dazzle-painted ship camouflage, this unidentified diagram was published in a British magazine repeatedly on the same page in the same location for several weeks. It simply read, A Dazzle Advertisement of a Dazzling Discovery. And then suddenly, in the last week of the ad campaign, an embedded figure solution appeared, also on the same page, same place. Camouflage has its uses, it said, but first stainless steel needs no protective covering. Fritz Heider, another Gestaltist, later wrote an essay on the apparent connections between camouflage, cubism, and Max Wertheimer's disclosure of our inherent grouping tendencies. According to Wertheimer, we are naturally inclined to see components as belonging together to the extent that they appear similar, are close together, or line up in space. Wertheimer called these perceptual organizing principles, but Heider wisely referred to them as unit-forming factors. Heider said that if you look at certain of Picasso's cubist paintings, such as the three musicians, after reading what Wertheimer said, it is readily apparent that cubism consisted partly in destroying the natural units of familiar objects by opposing one unit forming factor to another. One specific part of the picture may make a good unit with a table according to one factor, but according to another it belongs to the wall. But surely the same could be said of works by other cubists, among them George Brock and Juan Gris. They and other cubists were essentially devising variations on the theme of embedded figures, an approach that is all but identical to disruptive camouflage. It was humans, of course, who came up with the intellectual concept, as well as the terminology for an embedded figure. But its occurrence as a circumstance predates human existence, because it is commonly found in non-human forms in nature as well. In 1909, the American artist and naturalist Abbott H. Thayer made a colored diagram, shown here, that demonstrates how natural forms are potentially disruptive when parts appear to break apart, then merge to form new units with other things surrounding them. He applied the same techniques to watercolor sketches of fragmented ships. This is commonly observed in natural camouflage, as Thayer showed in a clever painting of a male wood duck, as included in his son's and his groundbreaking book on natural camouflage, titled Concealing Coloration in the Animal Kingdom. This wood duck painting was actually made by Richard S. Merriman, one of Thayer's apprentices, who served during World War I in the American Camouflage Corps. It demonstrates the radical degree to which highly different colors and shapes break up the overall form of the duck, an effect that is made more complex when shadows also break it up. Once broken, these disjointed fragments can easily appear to blend with similar shapes and colors in its natural surroundings. Thayer took it further. Especially memorable is a page in his book, a two-page sequence, really, in which he reproduces a painting of a visually fragmented copperhead snake made by Rockwell Kent, another apprentice, in dead leaves on a forest floor. Thus positioned, the embedded snake is hard to find. Until Thayer cleverly overlaps that page with one that simply consists of a cut-out silhouette of the same snake. Thayer was to some extent preoccupied 
with this technique of overlaid silhouette cutouts of looking through figures that were actually holes, not figures, and by that finding figures that a moment before had been backgrounds. The copperhead snake was certainly that, but so were a series of modified picture frames that made use of moving parts. Here are three of them, in which two photographs of each demonstration are positioned side by side to make before and after pairs. The first shows a painting of a hooded warbler, created by Abbot Thayer's son, Gerald. The image on the left appears to show two warblers positioned on a plain background, but as seen in the image beside it, there is a hinged wooden panel. In opening that panel, it now becomes apparent that only one warbler was painted on the hinged panel. But that panel also had a cut-out silhouette, so that, not unlike the copperhead snake, when the panel is lifted, a second warbler is found to be embedded in the painted background. In like manner, a second demonstration consists, on the left, of a painting of a male wood duck in a wooded setting, but as shown on the right, a cut-out silhouette overlay can be placed on the painting as a way of isolating the shape of the duck. Finally, the third example is much the same, although in this case it's a woodcock. It is embedded on the image on the left, then revealed on the right, by the overlaid silhouette. With the outbreak of World War I, Thayer became excited about the potential of extending his ideas about animal camouflage to the needs of Allied infantry. After realizing the folly of soldiers being issued brightly colored uniforms, it was decided that they should dress in monochrome sand-colored fabric, referred to as khaki, which is the Urdu word for dust. Thayer objected to the use of field service uniforms of plain, one-color fabric. He thought it was better to break it up, to counter the shading from overhead light, and to generally make it confusing. At some point, he announced that he had come up with a simple method by which any soldier, in any setting, could determine his own best camouflage pattern. This tube made use of cut-out silhouettes. All the soldier needed to do, Thayer proposed, is to cut out a silhouette of his own figure, or the generic shape of a man, and to study the colors and patterns that appeared in the whole of the figure when observed in his surroundings. Thayer had already explored this photographically to recreate the patterns of, for example, birds and skunks and he had also used the same device to prove that Native Americans and other indigenous peoples had used war paint and comparable disruptions as varieties of camouflage. Thayer's recommendation of a disruptively patterned field service uniform was not adopted by the Allied armies, although they are widely used today. But it was adopted, if not by Thayer's urging, by the British Navy, who in 1917 reconsidered the painting of ships with monochrome gray as camouflage. Instead, they began to use patterns that were conspicuously disruptive, and that soon invited comparison with brightly colored harlequin suits, crazy quilts at county fairs, barber poles, and cubism. High-difference ship camouflage quickly became known as dazzle painting or dazzle camouflage. It was not used with the intention of hiding a ship on the ocean, which simply was not possible given the changing conditions at sea, but rather for the purpose of confusion to make the vessel hard to hit by a German U-boat gunner who was underwater at a distance making complex calculations while peering through a periscope in what may have been turbulent weather. 
It is commonly said that this kind of ship camouflage was originated by a British artist named Norman Wilkinson. What is certain is that when this was adopted, the original intention was that no two ships would be painted alike, and, to increase the enemy's challenge, the two sides of any one ship would also differ markedly. Those restrictions were soon relaxed because it was all but impossible for the ship camouflage artist to keep pace with the demand. The dazzle camouflage approach was initially adopted by the British Admiralty in 1917, nearly three years into the war, so only a year or two remained for the production of ship camouflage. It was in 1917 that the U.S. entered the war on the side of the Allies, at which point it too decided to use disruptive dazzle camouflage schemes. By the end of the war, more than 5,200 British and American ships had been camouflaged this way. Given that figure, if all ship camouflage designs were one of a kind, and if no two sides of a ship were the same, the camouflage artist would have had to come up with 10,400 camouflage plans. How could they possibly do it, especially in such a limited time? The answer is, they couldn't. As a result, dazzle schemes were sometimes modified for multiple use on a number of ships, while the opposite sides were still distinct. One cannot help but wonder, did any of the camouflage artists come up with clever procedures by which they could speed up the daily production of dazzle designs? The answer is affirmative, although we do not know to what extent these were actually put into practice. Among most ingenious was a method that originated with an American Navy camouflor named Everett L. Warner. He was the person who oversaw the ship camouflors in Washington, D.C. at the design subsection of the U.S. Navy's camouflage section. Not only did he originate this method, he also documented it with photographs and described it in an article that was later published. Here is what we know about his innovative method of producing new schemes for the sides of ships. At some point, he discovered that the painters at the harbors, who were applying the schemes to the actual ships, did not fully understand how various distortions worked. As a result, he initiated the practice of requiring small groups of those painters to attend training sessions at the design subsection. The distortion effects were a challenge to explain, and Warner soon found it was helpful to have on hand a number of cut-up, variously colored wooden scraps to use in demonstrations. One day, while preparing these demonstrations, Warner inadvertently arranged a number of these scraps of wood on the surface of a table. With no particular purpose, a wooden model of a ship, painted in monochrome gray, had been placed on the same surface, so that it served as a contrasting background. At that point, Warner realized that he could easily rearrange the scraps in all but an infinite number of ways, and then use that arrangement as a flat, confusing pattern on the surface of the ship. If the scraps were aligned at an oblique angle, the plain gray ship behind them would appear to be positioned at the same angle. After this discovery, as Warner later recalled, the designs that were produced by the design subsection showed a greater tendency toward the use of obviously geometric forms. Amusingly, he added, it was precisely when our work was most firmly grounded on the book of Euclid that the uninitiated were the most positive that the ships were being painted haphazardly by a group of crazy cubists. It is of additional interest that Warner also wrote an article in which, like Abbott Thayer, he used cut-out silhouette overlays in explaining the virtues of dazzle patterns 
as compared to Battleship Grey. In doing this, he used cut-out silhouettes of ships, which he simply superimposed on blocks of typeset text with letters of various sizes. Nearly 40 years ago, at a time when I was thinking about Gottschalt's embedded figures while also studying ship camouflage, I devised a hypothetical dazzle scheme for a ship that showed how an embedded figure diagram might be used to produce an arbitrary plan. At the time, I did not realize that other people had arrived at the same idea long before I did. In 1954, for example, an inventor applied for a patent for an idea titled Puzzle, in which line drawings of animals become challenging to locate when they are overlaid by a sheet of transparent plastic on which has been printed a larger, more complex line drawing. I began to wonder if that patent was in any way a trigger for a Milton Bradley family game from the 1960s called Camouflage. It was also a television game show of the same name. As in the earlier patent, the contestants are expected to find a line drawing of an object that becomes embedded when it is overlaid by a sheet of other line drawings. The question remains, Given the huge demand for unique dazzle ship camouflage plans, is it possible that World War I camouflage artists might have sped up production if they had turned to finding dazzle schemes, such as by using silhouettes, instead of making them from scratch? The answer is that at least one ship camouflage did indeed experiment with embedded figures, although it is not certain how far he took it. The artist was a World War I British camouflage named Frank H. Mason. As revealed on page 41 of James Taylor's book, Dazzle, Disguise and Disruption in War and Art, there is a page in one of Mason's sketchbooks on which there is a pencil-drawn plan for a ship camouflage scheme in which he has embedded a portion of a landscape view of houses, almost to the point of abstraction. I was unaware of Mason's experiment when, a few years ago, I made scores of camouflage schemes by way of computer by superimposing digital ship silhouettes onto public domain photographs as well as artworks from the past. Mm -hmm.